Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm so happy to welcome you to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. And we launched Nature Hour two months ago with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community partners. Over the past nine weeks, we've featured presenters like Keith Williams from Freshwater Journeys, who explored the underwater world of our local streams and rivers. Dan Ardia, a professor of biology at Franklin and Marshall College, who has been documenting wildlife in our preserves and our community, and recently launched the Lancaster Wildlife Project. And Elise Jurgen from Waxwing EcoWorks, who focused on native plants and the importance for each of us to rebuild biodiversity on our own properties. Each of these were recorded, as is this evening's presentation, and are on our YouTube channel. We'll be sure to include a link with our follow-up email. We have multiple virtual lectures taking place during Lancaster Water Week, August 7 through 15, including presentations on the Turkey Hill Dairy Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay Clean Water Partnership, which is working with dairy farmers on clean water best management implementation. We also have very exciting presentations with uh, about the history of the Conestoga River in partnership with Lancaster History, rain garden and pollinator design in partnership with the city of Lancaster, and the hidden world of stream insects with Stroud Water Research. To learn more about these upcoming virtual lectures as part of Water Week, please visit lancasterwaterweek.org. After a short break, we will return with more nature hours in September. Look for an announcement of speakers and dates coming soon. Tonight, I'm joined by my two incredible colleagues from our Community Impact Department, Kelly Snavely, our Director of Marketing and Communications, and Faith DeJong, our Development and Annual Fund Coordinator. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support, and tonight we want to recognize Turkey Hill Dairy, who is our presenting sponsor of Lancaster Water Week, and Clark Associates, who is our lead annual sponsor. Thank you, Turkey Hill Dairy and Clark Associates. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Megan Gonick. Dr. Gonick practices naturopathic and traditional Chinese medicine at Generative Health LLC in downtown Lancaster and teaches botanical medicine at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. Her undergraduate studies at Millersville University focused on plant biology and chemistry and her naturopathic graduate thesis looked at the effects of growing plants in their native environment on their medical chemical composition. She has been a speaker and written for United Plant Savers Conference. She is currently involved in the startup of a local nonprofit clinic, Natural Wellness Collective, to help provide health education and services to underserved communities focused on herbal and other cost-effective natural remedies. Welcome, Dr. Gonick. Thank you, Fritz. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just start. Um, with my presentation, since Fritz has already introduced me thoroughly. And I'm gonna try and keep it on track. Um, so I won't get into herbs too much that I'm not focusing on. But if you have questions about them, there's a lot more herbs included on these slides and there's a lot more that we can use. Um, I'm just highlighting a few tonight. So we've already heard about me. Here's some beautiful blueberries for you. The blueberries are very good for the eyes and the blood vessels, uh, the berries themselves. That pigment is actually part of what's used. And the leaves are a very nice diuretic and they get the beautiful fall color and the wonderful wildlife. So the first thing I really wanna talk about is native plants, which means Native American plants. We often think about what grows in European herbal gardens or the most rare and exotic plants we can think of. But the pre-colonial First Nations people of the Americas had many different medical systems, which they were generous enough to share a lot of that knowledge with the people who came to this country from other places. They did a lot of what we would call wild crafting, where herbal medical plants were planted and come and you would be able to return to that same spot and you'd have this medicine chest that was just growing in the wild. And that was done with foods as well. And as the people migrated here from other continents, they'd bring the plants that were important to them. 
their foods, the things they used for clothes, the things that had spiritual value or economic value, or even just horticultural value. So we got a lot of plants from all over the world. Um, but not all of them are from here originally, and not all of them are as adapted to the environment. So I'm going to focus on those native plants that are well adapted to the environment. But I want to just make a note that as of 10 years ago, these numbers have, are much worse today, I'm sure. At least 15,000 of the estimated 50 to 70,000 of plant species used in medicine and cosmetics were threatened and endangered. So it's really important that we can help preserve those populations. A good way to do that is to use what is widely available and grows near you, or to help plant those plants that do grow native in your environment that will grow on your property to preserve them. So the benefits of a native herb garden, all the benefits of an herb garden. You'll have ingredients for teas and poultices. Um, that's a topical application of herbs for any of you that are new to an herb garden. And it's going to add beauty and it's going to provide birds and butterflies um, coming to your yard. But using natives means that these plants are also already well adapted to the environment in this region. And our native plants in this area, we have a lot of selections for shade or wet soils, which may trouble some of us. And we also get some integrated pest management coming by by way of already attracting some of the predators that help protect these plants. And in the long term, it can be less work to have a native herb garden, um, depending on how you want to do it. And it's ideal, these are ideal plants to use for permaculture, where you plant the plants and maybe you arrange them or trim them a bit, but you don't have to keep going back. The plants come back year after year. So let's have some considerations if you're planning to add some native plants or you're planning to start a native herb garden that you didn't have before. You wanna think about the soil, of course. Is it wet or dry? pH can be an issue. What's the sun? And what kind of space do you have that you're working with? Um, as far as sun, you also might want to think about ways to use your shade. Don't just give up on it. You can layer it. You can put plants underneath your trees and bushes or in other shady areas. And you also want to think about enclosures or, enclo or more restricted spaces for some of the plants that you might be concerned about spreading. Just because it's native doesn't mean it can't spread uh, when it gets in an environment it likes. Some of these plants will spread well. Also, are there special flavors or, or scents or special actions you're looking for? You want to pick herbs that can provide those things for you. And what is the desired look? Some people will go for a wilder look or a more refined garden. Do you need specific colors? Do you want specific colors? And do you want flowering times to be a consideration so that you have flowers coming and then other flowers following them? Also, what wildlife are you interested in attracting? That can be a uh, reason to use a certain plant. And if there's certain pests you want to avoid. Uh, companion plants can be a great thing as well. Um, plants that help support others near them. And soil safety testing is something to consider. If you haven't used this land for food or medicine before, or if you have reason to think that this may be a disturbed site where there was a lot of lead-based lead paint getting into the soil or gasoline or something else that could have some toxins, you don't want to combine heavy metals and toxins with your medicine. So it's fairly easy to get your soil tested. So regional considerations, we're usually zone six to seven, more zone six. Um, we're in the mid-Atlantic Piedmont Plateau along the Susquehanna River Valley. And so different plants, you're gonna wanna think about what kind of yard, you, yard or space you have. So a dry to moist meadow, um, is going to give you an idea of some things for the sun um, that'll do well with drier soils. Um, again, meadows are going to provide plants that do well with more sun. 
as far as thickets that can give you some things that'll grow along a fence or if you want to create a little barrier in an area with a little more sun, you get some ideas there. And like I said, I'm not going to talk about all these plants, but feel free to ask questions about them. So my first plant is mountain mint. I love mountain mint because it has a little of that smell and a little of that flavor of mint, but it's really easy to grow, much like a regular mint, um, but it's a whole different genus. And it spreads very easily. It has these white flowers. It's in the mint family. And you can use um, a couple different species of this. And it will attract some pollinators, butterfly, has some deer resistance, and it's very tolerant of soils, um, not going the whole way to wet soils generally. And it would like a little sun but it's great for stomach, uh, upset stomach, gas, um, to help with digestion, much like other mints. Um, it can be used for sinus headaches and can help you sweat. That's a diaphoretic um, during an illness. It can help you sweat to lower your fever uh, naturally. Um, main species I'm talking about is the Virginianum, but you can see there's a few other species that are commonly used this way as well. You can chew the fresh leaves or use a handful of leaves in a bath, and I really like that method. There's not a lot of menthol in it, so it doesn't get too tingly. Uh, caution, it isn't well researched, and it has some of the same components as pennyroyal, so I would avoid it, especially during pregnancy. Um, generally, they say to avoid it during pregnancy and lactation if it's not well researched. Next one is more well known in herbal medicine. Blue skull cap, also called mad dog skull cap. Um, I love the scutellaria. The above ground plant is what we use. It gets beautiful blue purple flowers. It wants a little bit more of a wet environment. It can deal with some light shade, but it's more of a sun plant. And it's great for us right now because it's a calming nervine tonic. Very relaxing. It's in that mint family. I wanted to just mention there's another species, Bicolensis, which is more often what you're talking about when you hear scutellaria. And that's actually used as a root in Chinese medicine as an immune stimulant. Um, the one I'm talking about, the native one, is used more often as an above ground plant. And that's what's used for the sedative, relaxant, and tonic to help calm that nervous system. It's great when one's exhausted and just can't relax. It can help with spasms, very mildly can help decrease blood pressure. It has a mild bitter taste that can be really nice if you're into bitters and has a little bit of an analgesic effect. Cautions, pregnancy and lactation, just due to not a lot of research, but generally it's regarded as safe. It's uh, one that the government knows about as a generally regarded as safe plant. Um, tends to be a little, can create a little drowsiness um, or giddiness and confusion. Um, and one note is when you're making a tea with this, with the mountain mint as well, you want to keep them covered, particularly things in the mint family or other things that have a strong smell. If you keep them covered, you're not going to lose any of the essential oils. You don't need to seep them for too long and you can have one to three cups a day. And for short terms, you could have three to six cups a day. So another choice to relax would be passion flower, otherwise known as maypop. This one's native a little bit south most of the time, mid-Atlantic and southern U.S. Um, you don't want to collect this from the wild, and you don't want to eat the take the fruits from the wild and eat them, just in case it's not an escaped plant and it is passion flower lutea, which is another species which is threatened in PA. Um, it's a vine. You can train it to grow on a lot of different things. It has these lovely purple flowers. The fruit can, is green and then purple. Um, tends to be a little smaller than the South American fruit that we usually eat, but it has a similar flavor and full sun to light shade, so you can grow it a lot of different places. Bumblebees like it, ruby-throated hummingbirds, it's perennial. It's a hypnotic nervine. It's very, very relaxing. But 
some of its effects are similar to MAOIs, uh, which are some medications that people will take sometimes. So it can interact with MAOIs, benzodiazepines and phenobarbital, also things containing tyramine you don't want to take in addition to passion flowers. So some energy drinks may have some tyramine. Um, avoid during pregnancy um, and with moderate to severe depression. But it can be really helpful for getting you to sleep and there's no lethargy in the morning typically from this. It can also help with mild to moderate anxiety. And you're gonna use the buds or the leaves and uh, about a teaspoon per cup of water in covered one to four times a day. You probably already know this one, Echinacea. Um, it's in the Asteraceae family. That's the aster, daisy, sunflower family. This one's actually a Midwestern native, but a lot of people grow it in our range. Um, in doing my research, just to check up on some things, I found there is a species, the smooth purple cone flower that's native to our region, but isn't really found very present anymore. I'm not sure if that one's still um, in existence or not, or if it's been too crossed into other populations. You're gonna get this reddish purple flower from July, in between July and October. It tends to like more moist, fertile, well-drained soil, which is kind of a, and it will tolerate drought, sandy, or clay soils. It, tracks pollinators, butterflies, and songbirds. I was taking pictures of some the other day and it was just covered in butterflies and bees. Great immune stimulant um, and beautiful ornamental. It can help produce sweating uh, as part of the immune support. It can aid in balancing an immune system. It has some local antiseptic, antibiotic, and antiviral effects shown in some research. Um, cautions, for all of these Daisy family plants, aster family plants. If you have aster family allergies, be careful. Take a little bit the first time. See and make sure you don't get any tongue tingling or any issues. Echinacea is one of the more common plants to cause tongue tingling, um, which is a very mild allergic response, but uh, we generally don't want to push it. You could go for another plant instead. Also people with HIV or AIDS, it's not a good choice because it does uh, lower before lifting T cell counts. And it, there's a concern of people using this if they have autoimmune disease. I would say just take another immune stimulant instead. And this is one where you're gonna do the root. So when you're doing roots or barks, you put them in water first, bring it to a slow boil and simmer it. Then you often will let it rest for a little while. And then you can drink it um, uh, sometimes warm, particularly if you're trying to break a sweat, and sometimes cool if you prefer it that way. The German Commission E um, herbal notes uh, suggest that you could actually press the fresh plant as well. And in that case, you don't have to use up your root. So Western yarrow. I was surprised. Yarrow is a native plant, but it's a variety of yarrow. The same species could also be the European plant. It depends on which variety you have. Um, the native variety is white flowers, um, and it does have those lovely yarrow flowers, those lovely feathery leaves. It will spread. So again, it's one that can spread. Um, it attracts butterflies. And it's very good as an astringent. So an astringent tightens tissues, can help reduce swelling, can make your skin look nice and tight, um, can help wounds heal faster. And this one does have wound healing voluntary um, activities. Also, it's a styptic. That means it stops bleeding. They used to make styptic sticks that people could use during shaving. So uh, tea of this can be applied um, to an area, small cuts that are bleeding to help them stop bleeding faster. It's good for clotting as a styptic, it's good for healing, and it's really good for breaking fevers. Um, if you need to get a big sweat when someone has a fever that just won't go down, a tea of yarrow can be really helpful for that. Um, the ageline, the blue essential oil that you'll find in all yarrows, um, 
can help reduce inflammation and promote healing. So in that case, you want to keep it covered if you're making a tea of it. Um, again, the astringent can help with the healing as well. It has a little bit of a diuretic effect, so it will um, produce a little more urine. And it also can help bring on the menses. So for that reason, you wouldn't want to use this one during pregnancies. It can also help a little bit with digestion by being a little bit bitter. Anything that's a little bit bitter, if it's not toxic, is helpful to digestion. Uh, again, uh, careful if you have allergies to aster plants. And this one, you're going to infuse a little longer if you're looking for the astringent properties. If you're just looking uh, for the azuraline properties, you could infuse it a little shorter, but usually you're looking for both. And for fevers, drink it warm. Uh, elderberry. So the berries aren't quite black yet. The American elder is a species is a subspecies of the black elder. Sometimes it's listed as its own species, Canadensis. Sometimes it's listed as a subspecies. Um, this is the elderberry. Elderberry wine is made of um, elderberries. So this one will spread fast, has a beautiful form. Um, it is tolerant to most things. It will grow on the edge of your woods if you want a little barrier there. You get large showy white flowers June to July and then you're going to get blackberries. Um, the birds may come and try and take a lot of them but if you're trying to harvest them you can get some. Um, 34 species of butterfly and moth use this for their caterpillars and songbirds love it. Uh, the things that are used are either the flowers or the cooked berries and they're both safe herbal immune stimulants. A note about the berries, you don't want to eat the raw berries. Um, that can cause nausea and vomiting. So they really do need to be cooked a little bit. Um, both, the er both the flower and the berries can have a gentle effect to help you sweat, can help you um, clean out your system. You want to keep hydrated with any of these things that help with sweating or diuretics also can be a tonic to the lung and help you clear mucus out of the bronchioles, the um, upper parts of the lung. The fruits can be a laxative, um, but only the fruits. And it's a very good immune stimulant preventative uh, for viruses, but particularly for influenza, it's helpful. Um, I have some instructions on how you would cook down the berries. Uh, you can add a little honey to that as well to make a syrup. So the next one is cramp bark. It's often called high bush cranberry, but I just know it as cramp bark. It is wonderful for all types of cramps. It is a beautiful plant. I've helped grow this one. It has uh, three lobes to the leaf, has those white viburnum flowers. It's in that honeysuckle family. Uh, it's fast growing, but I wouldn't say it's as fast as the elderberry. Um, and the red berries can last through the winter. It tolerates most soils, but it's not fond of salt. Uh, you found that for a lot of things. Um, it attracts butterflies and songbirds. And it's cooling, relaxing, antispasmodic. It's great for cramps, GI cramps, like gas or colic genital urinary cramps, um, mostly menstrual or uh, birthing pains, and skeletal muscle cramps. It can help relieve pain, can calm the nerves, and it does help bring on the menses. So pregnancy, it's something that's more towards the end um, if someone's having cramps towards the end. Uh, cautions, if someone has a bleeding disorder or is using anticoagulants, you wanna make sure that their blood is well monitored um, because this does help, um, help with um, bleeding a bit. And so again, instructions on how to make a decoction and when being taken for cramps, it could be as close as every 15 minutes. So two, I just covered real quick, goldenrod, I'm not gonna get into too much, but watch out for that uh, Asteraceae allergy thing. Um, good for respiratory and GU. The other one, uh, wild comfrey, different genus, but has many of the same effects. The Borage family is great for healing. Um, this one in particular is uh, 
great for tissue repair and regeneration, used for bone, soft tissue, and skin injuries. Um, cautions, internally, you don't want to use too much of this. Most things in the Borge family have a toxin called pyrrolizidine alkaloids uh, that in small amounts most people can handle. Pregnant people shouldn't ever have them. People with liver problems shouldn't have them. Uh, generally you want to be cautious with them and no one should take these plants long term internally. Topically you don't have to worry about that. Uh, applying the bruised leaves or the leaves heated in a hot compress, great for an injury. Uh, if there's a broken bone, make sure it's set by a professional first. And this can be a great combination with that yarrow. So some notes on safety. Um, whether you're using herbs or over-the-counter things from the drugstore, some complaints should be left to a professional. Some are safer to treat at home. Any symptom that can indicate the possibility of an underlying condition or that needs to be evaluated should be managed only by a licensed doctor, physician's assistant, or advanced um, practice uh, registered nurse. These are the people who are trained to diagnose disease from a biomedicine standpoint and really deal with possible emergencies and rule them out. So if there's something that's concerning you that you're like, should I go to the doctor? Usually it's good to get it checked. You can self-diagnose symptoms. Most symptoms have a name, but don't try to self-diagnose the disease without help if you don't have any training. And remember, Google's not a doctor. It can be misleading and sometimes there is stuff that's incorrect out there. And remember that some herbs can be poisonous uh, if used incorrectly. It's the dose that makes something a poison. For some things, that's a huge dose, but for some other things, that's a very small dose. So you wanna know what you're doing. When do you need a doctor? Well, safety is always the best policy. Some good things um, to consider treating at home would be occasional mild problems, especially things that you've had before that you know are not a serious concern of your doctor that aren't worrying you or them. So some gas or cramping with digestion, digestive upset, um, headaches, sinus irritation, seasonal allergies, insomnia or mild stress, a fever or cold. Keep in mind if it's something that you might want to be concerned with, um, you're worried about a novel disease, you would want to check in with the doctor about that or make sure they okay you doing home treatment. Sore muscles, painful joints and bruises that are not unusual, that are to be expected from what you've done over the day before you had them. Small cuts or scrapes, skin irritation, minor burns, and preventative. Um, these are all great things to use herbs for. Um, anytime there is significant swelling and redness that won't go down after an injury, especially if the redness travels towards the center of the body, that's something you'd want to have checked out. Any broken bones or misaligned joints, cuts that re require stitches, uh, large or severe burns, puncture wounds, get them checked out, get them stitched up. Do not put any kind of comfrey on an open wound. It needs to be taken care of first. If it's a scrape, that's fine. But if it's serious, make sure um, it's closed if it needs to be closed. And also any cancer, cardiac, heart disease, or endocrine diseases really should be evaluated and managed. So other safety rules of thumb, make sure you have the right herb. Don't buy from unreliable parties, especially right now. I'm constantly getting notices from the Botanical Council about ways to test and deal with um, people sending out false herbs as the wrong thing right now because the supply chains have broken down from where they usually were at and the demand for certain things has gone way up. So best case scenario, it's CVS and you're getting something that's essentially useless if it's not a reliable company. Worst case scenario, it might be the wrong thing um, and that might not be intentional. So you wanna make sure who you're getting it from is very reliable. 
never collect or wildcraft herbs from contaminated sites like roadsides or sites with possible waste dumping history. You don't want to collect even things you're trying to get rid of if you're going to take them internally from these places. For topical use, if you want to collect some plantain, that should be fine, um, but not for internal use. Don't use a plant that isn't identified. This could have a safety concern. Also, you could be getting a plant that is one that we want to actually leave where it is. Make sure you or who you're listening to is really qualified to identify the herb or herbs in question. And always have a guidebook, uh, like a Peterson guide, to check for poisonous or endangered species that look alike. Um, you don't want to take an endangered species out of the wild, and you certainly don't want to take a poisonous species uh, for personal use. Make sure it's safe for you. So an herb might be safe for someone else, but not for you. Look for any cautions, see if you're in any of those groups, and look for herb-drug interactions if you're taking any medications. So now we come to the shade plants. I love the shady plants. Um, so I separated wet and dry forest. A lot of these I'm not gonna talk about, but if you ask me questions, I'll definitely talk about them. There's a link here for a native plant finder. You can also find it through the Conservancy site. Uh, that'll give you a lot of ideas for your region, which is a great option. So witch hazel, I had to include, I know we already have yarrow, so a lot of the things are gonna overlap, but this one has beautiful yellow flowers in the fall uh, when you're not getting as much color. It has a medium growth rate, so it won't spread so much as elderberries, so you can plant it and you don't have to worry about having to cut it back or contain it quite as much. Full sun to shade. It is a little sensitive to salts, um, and it's really used for those astringent tannins. And I think it's really nice that this can be used sometimes in place of calendula. Um, so if you're used to using a calendula comfrey and you wanna go more native, if you can get wild comfrey and uh, have some witch hazel, you could make your own native version. Um, it helps reduce edema a lot. It's very nice for uh, blood vessels that are swollen. That's why this is the key ingredient on tux pads for hemorrhoids. Um, this is also what you find in witch hazel, astringent from the drugstore. Um, and that is wonderful topically. It's gonna have either alcohol or glycerin in it, but it's not really usually made for internal consumption. So if you're gonna use it internally, you're gonna want to um, you're gonna want to make your own tea. Um, it can be used as a tea as long as it's not excessive and excessive in this case means 10 to 15 cups a day. So you should be good, but it does have tannins. That's part of what's so astringent about it. So you wouldn't wanna take a calcium supplement at the same time. It would make it harder for you to absorb those minerals. Things with tannins shouldn't be taken continuously and they shouldn't be taken at the same time as minerals. And when you're getting collecting from a woody plant like this, um, you wanna remove the bark from cuttings if possible, especially since this one's not as fast growing or in lengthwise from branches so that you're not circling any branches and definitely try to avoid the stem. So wintergreen, this one, I feel like it doesn't get enough press. We often use birch as a replacement for wintergreen these days, but this is a beautiful ground cover that will tolerate a, a fair amount of shade. Um, so this is in the blueberry family. You'll see the, the berries aren't quite as obvious. Actually, this is a different species, I think. Um, here's the red berries. Um, well, that was the flowers, but that's another species. And this species has red berries and fall color. Blueberries great for fall color, that whole family. Host to just two caterpillar species, but just lovely. Dry to wet woods and barrens. It's used for the scent, the flavor, the berries are edible. It's used in herbal medicine. Uh, tea of crushed leaf or crushed leaves can be used for joint and rheumatic pains. So it's really a great pain reliever, especially for rheumatic complaints. Here you can see the um, bell flowers a little better. Muscle soreness, it can be helpful for 
digestive colic and flatulence, but not excessive doses. The oil shouldn't be taken internally. Um, it's useful for fevers and sore throats. One of the big things that's active in this is uh, methyl salicylate, which is a type of aspirin compound. So small children and pregnant women should not ingest it. Also, the essential oil should not be used on small children or on pregnant women over their belly. And this goes for willow bark as well. These are just as dangerous to small children as aspirin, so we want to try to avoid that. Um, there's lots of other great things they can use, like mint. Um, huge doses, again, internally can cause GI inflammation. I found a really interesting recipe that suggested leaving the leaves and or berries in a cup of water uh, for two days sitting in a jar um, and then warm it rather than infusing it directly to get more of the oils out and more of the flavor because a lot of what you're looking for here is in the oil. Partridge berry, just threw it in real quick. It makes a nice dense mat. Um, not quite the same, but beautiful berries as well. Really good in the shade, so it gives you more shade options. But partridge berry is one, you know, we want to watch out for our wild populations. Wood geranium, um, just so pretty. Pink flowers in May, grows really well around here. Uh, 27 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars use it. It's deer resistant. Again, this is another one that's astringent helps tone tissues, helps reduce edema, styptic stops bleeding, and helps heal. It's anti-inflammatory and it's been used for excessive uterine bleeding and it's a tonic, so it's considered to be safer to use long-term than some other things. And it doesn't have, it's not so tanning as the witch hazel. White turtle head. I love these flowers. It needs to be wet though. This is a moist to wet obligate species. Uh, it attracts the butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Uh, flowers between July and September. The shade's gonna vary it a lot. It's a digestive bitter, so it'll help stimulate the digestive system through its bitter, but uh, it's also um, useful for increasing bile flow. And so that'll also help a little bit with bowel movements and helps kill worms, although normally we're not gonna go to herbs for that. Um, it can be a good tonic after a weakened state for the young or the elderly. Bloodroot, okay, this one is threatened, but it seems to be doing really well in our area, especially if you drive around in early April, May. Um, white showy flowers, beautiful um, green leaves uh, with beautiful lobes. Um, sun to partial shade. There is a horticultural variety with a double flower, but I like the native wild ones just as much. The ants are amazing with this one. They will take the seeds and spread it in neat little lines, making beautiful rows for you without any work, just as long as you get enough to get enough seeds. Um, again, it's threatened and endangered in other places. When the root of a plant is used, as in the case of bloodroot, um, it's much more likely to become threatened and endangered. This was traditionally one of our best antibiotics um, and antiseptics. It was used in dental health um, fairly recently. Um, and it can be added to a mouthwash or some alcohol to get some of that. It's really good for oral hygiene and killing those bacteria. So it can be helpful for gingivitis. It has some pain killing properties. It's in the poppy family. Uh, it's also can be used for warts and skin lesions. Please don't waste this on warts. You can use dandelion. Um, it's extremely bitter though. And the whole plant, um, the leaves when you break them off, the flower when you break them off, never on purpose, but it has happened by accident, will sort of bleed, even the root will when it's fresh. The caution I really have with this one, um, there was some 
reports going around about it being dangerous to healthy cells. That doesn't seem to be true. I've talked to a number of herbalists about it. Um, but using this on yourself to treat lesions that aren't diagnosed or diagnosed lesions that are not warts, um, that are potentially problematic, really shouldn't be done without supervision because you really could miss something. You could take care of what's above the surface and there could be more that needs to be dealt with. And I love this plant and I love heavy duty herb medicine and I have a ton of it and I still can't bring myself to dig it up to use it. I think it's just better to keep it there and know that I have that medicine chest in my yard. So when you value something, you wanna protect it. We want to think about these things that can become endangered. So over here we have blue cohosh. And one of the things that leads to endangerment is the amount of demand, how much it's in demand, how much people think it's useful, sometimes how much people think it's exotic. Um, can it be grown easily? So a lot of our native forest botanicals that are heavy duty medicine don't grow as well on farms. You could grow some blue cohosh on a farm, but trying to grow hydrastis on a farm is not really gonna happen much. Um, what part of the plants used? As I mentioned before, the roots are gonna use up the plant much faster. It's not gonna have a lot of chance to recover. The, how fast the plant can grow and reproduce and how it reproduces. And it's habitat being lost. And this is something we can't completely stop. Donating to the Conservancy and helping preserve lands is going to be amazing, but there's so many places lands are going. So if we can all plant these things in our yards, we can add a little uh, extra spot of protection. Agriculture and climate change are also going to affect this. Uh, climate change brings different plants into the region and um, can change the competition. Displacement from other species. That's all I'll go pull some garlic mustard and lack of alternative sources. So unless people really think of alternate alternatives they can use and they use just one plant, it can get used up. Growing native and using your own supply helps preserve the natives and their ecosystem for the future. So I'm gonna run through a couple of things quickly and then I'll turn it back over. Um, two famous endangered species that you should not collect, but if you go through the right nurseries, you can get seeds or plants, or you may have friends. I've gotten a golden seal plant from a friend who had an abundance on their property. So these don't grow fast, they don't spread fast, but they're amazing medicine and they are things that need to be protected because they are over harvested and the roots are used. And they have amazing properties. And I imagine we're just gonna find out more wonderful things for the future. But right now our job is to protect them um, so that our children and our children's children will have access to these plants. Two other ones that are threatened, endangered, um, Trillium. Generally, it's not used for medicine anymore, but people do sometimes collect it as a specimen. This is one that if you can keep it in your yard and spread it in your yard, that's the way to do it. And you can get it from most uh, native, a lot of native plant nurseries that have flowers. Um, blue cohosh does so well in our woods. Um, this has been used as an herbal medicine for pregnancy. There've been some fights over it lately, um, but generally, um, it's uh, well tolerated and it has beautiful, beautiful blueberries, um, but each of those is just one. It's not a cluster of seeds. So use your foraging for invasive species. Go out and get them. That plantain, you can rub it right on insect bites, wounds. You can use it similar to a comfrey. Not quite as strong, but it's, it's pretty good medicine actually. Wineberry, go ahead and eat it but then cut it back. <laughs> Garlic mustard. This is great for an herb butter, herb bread, has a great flavor. Go get them. Get it on the year it's not seeding too because then you don't even have to worry about the bitterness from the flower. Whorehound um, makes a great um, throat upper respiratory support. 
Speedwells and cleavers are great diuretics, great for cleaning the body out. Kudzu is amazing immune support and also anti-aging. That stuff we're all supposed to drink red wine for, we can just extract it from kudzu if you're not into red wine. If you are, you could do kudzu soaked red wine or something like that. Multiflora rose, those rose hips, if they're not sprayed, are a great source of vitamin C. And dandelion is amazing in so many ways. Um, it just has a thousand uses. Don't grow any of these because they're everywhere. Just get them. So a few substitutions, I promise this, uh, for common European herbs. A lot of times we forget that there are more than one variety or species and that they might be native to different regions. So there are a number of sages um, that have been used as substitutes and we did a lot more herbal substituting in the past when herbs were a bigger part of our um, apothecary and dispensaries in the United States. But lyre leaf sage, um, lance leaf sage, both are good sage um, substitutes. White sage is endangered. Um, you want to be a little careful with that. And of course, if you're buying these from native plant nurseries, you, you know, um, we have a nice reliable list from the conservancy, so you should feel comfortable with that. Wild ginger. While it's not terribly closely related to the ginger that we all put in our tea, it can be used to calm the stomach similarly and um, has been used as a substitute in the past. St. John's wort, the dense flowered St. John's wort and St. Andrew's cross both seem to be denser ground covers and lovely substitutes for St. John's wort with similar actions, beautiful yellow flowers. Blue verbrain can be used as a, suggest as a substitute for verbena. It's generally regarded as safe. Heal all, there are different varieties. Some are native, some are European. So the lancelata is a native variety. Floracy root or butterfly weed, you know it is butterfly weed. It's also amazing lung support. That's why it's called pleurisy root. This has some pyrolizidine alkaloids. If you're not a herbalist, I would suggest, you know, using supervision on that one, but plant it, it's beautiful. Wild indigo, uh, Baptisia tincturala. This one fixes nitrogen. Uh, as a member of the bean family, and it's really helpful for a balanced immune support. Um, but again, it's one that, you know, you don't want to collect, you want to buy and help preserve. And evening uh, primrose, um, most of the species are native. So here's that butterfly weed, and you just want to grow it. And here's my references, so I can actually turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you so much, Megan. We really appreciate that presentation. Um, absolutely incredible knowledge on just how everything is so interconnected and when you know we're able to plant those species and be able to help our ecosystems and make sure that those incredible medicine trusts as you described continue, um, that we really help heal ourselves in the same moment. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time for a few questions for Megan. Uh, if you want to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, we'll be able to go through a few, a few of those um, here at the end of the presentation. While you go ahead and put your questions in that Q&A box, I just want to remind you of some of our upcoming events again. We have Lancaster Water Week coming up August 7th through 15th with more virtual lectures as well as our Lancaster Pledge, which is new this, our Lancaster Water Week Pledge, which is new this year, which encourages each of you to take three action steps um, to ensure that our waterways stay clean and that we have swimmable, fishable, and drinkable waterways in our lifetime. Um, so let's see here if we have a few questions for Megan. Um, I also just want to remind you that this presentation is being recorded, and for those of you who came in halfway through, um, we will make sure um, that you receive a link to the full presentation as well as some of the links that uh, Dr. Gonick is speaking about um, from our presentation. So let's see here. Some of the first questions we have, um, can any of these be grown um, indoors, Megan? Do any of them, you know, subsist well inside? 
So generally, uh, it's going to depend on your light, but a number of these can be grown indoors. I've grown um, the partridge berry indoors along with yarrow, so that one needs a little more light. Uh, the bushes are probably a bad idea unless you have a lot of space to try and grow them indoors. Um, I would think you could do a potter of mountain mint if you get enough sun as well. Um, you know, it's most of these are that I covered are ones that will grow fairly well. You just got to get their conditions. Some things like hydrastis and ginseng, they are incredibly picky and they need their woods. Thank so you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we had a question um, about whether or not you have an opinion on Bach flower remedies. So Bach flower remedies are um, a homeopathic similar to a homeopathic type of remedy. And the neat thing about both flower remedies and homeopathics is that they use so little of the plant. They're really trying to capture an energetic component as opposed to just a chemical component of the plant. I think Bach Flowers um, uses just the flowers. And I believe there's also some companies that just do the buds, the gemotherapy. And when you do this sort of thing, you really are not using up um, much resources in creating it. You're mostly using lots of spring water as you dilute it over time. Um, and I have seen people have really good effects uh, for Bach flower remedies, rescue remedy. People love it and seem to be very well affected by it. And honestly, as a biochemistry background, I wasn't really looking to uh, use much homeopathy, but having a small child and having homeopathy be so easy to give a small child and so safe, I found that it can be very helpful. Thank you. Well, um, we'll definitely be sharing our native plant uh, nursery list with all the attendees. We had a question about where these plants can be purchased in Lancaster County or, or close by. Do you have any favorite places that that you favorite? Well, for Woody's, um, that's not quite in Lancaster County, um, but out near Longwood Gardens, I used to work at Natural Landscapes Nursery, and they have, as far as blueberries, oh, amazing, and they have all your Woody, you know, medicinal native plants that you'd be looking for, but they don't carry any of the um, herbs that aren't Woody. Um, and there are a lot of great native nurseries and the list that the Conservancy has is pretty much the ones I would tell you, <laughs> so. That's great. I personally have a question. Um, what are the favorite um, herbs that you have in your yard right now or that you have in your medicine chests in your, in your garden? Well, my one little hydrastis I am so in love with. Um, I have a ton of bloodroot because I love it. Uh, <laughs> I also uh, have blow cohosh that just volunteered itself and I was looking for it and it just came. When you really connect with these things, I hear people say a lot of times when they connect with these plants, they just sort of appear for them when they want them. And it seems insane, but I do find it to be true. This year, I just had black cohosh appear for the first time ever out of nowhere and I was in need of some black cohosh. So that was kind of amazing for me. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Megan. We have one last question um, about whether or not you've ever used brown pine or bracken fern. You know, that's a great question. I actually haven't. Um, I know some uses for ground pine, um, but I generally haven't really used either of those too much. Um, the only fern I tend to use is I, I have the, um, oh, I'm blanking on it now, ostrich fern, which uh, we use for food but I haven't used either of those. Although I do have some ground pine growing just because I really, I found uh, someone who was selling some, so I got it. <laughs> Wonderful. It looks like we have uh, one, actually one last question time for, um, from Sheila. Um, she's exploring container gardening with natives, um, cone, uh, coneflower, goldenrod, and she wants to know um, if you have any advice on how you might protect them through the winter if left outside in the container. So I actually, we used to have more um, non-woodies at the nursery I was at. And a lot of these, you know, would do okay. 
through the winter provided you pack the pots close together to keep them a little warmer. If you have that microclimate of a slightly warmer spot near the house, you might want to do that where they're near the house. Um, and also if you get, um, you know, one of those plastic covers for them or some kind of cover just to give them a little more warmth. You know, the, the Eucara does pretty well in a pot over the winter. Um, I'm not sure about the coneflower and the goldenrod because I haven't grown those in containers before, but generally packing them closer together and just making sure their, their roots don't freeze. You know, they're native to our region or close enough, so they can deal with some cold, but you don't want to freeze their roots too much. Thank you so much, Megan, for answering these questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, to everyone who's joined us today, um, we'll be making sure that we send out this recording afterwards and we welcome all of your feedback. Please feel free to reply to that email with any suggestions that you might have or feedback on Nature Hour so far. And as Fritz said at the beginning, uh, we will be coming back with Nature Hour in mid-September and we hope you'll join us for Lancaster Water Week. I want to pass it back over to Fritz for some final words here um, as we close out this Nature Hour. Thank you, Kelly. Megan, I want to thank you for your thorough presentation. There are so many things to consider when transforming our gardens. I'm struck by the challenges we face with the collapse of our insect, bird, and animal populations, and how the very same plants we use to boost these populations are also the very same plants we can use to heal our bodies. You mentioned aesthetics and how these gardens look a little wild. I think this may be one of our largest challenges locally. We're so used to our English style gardens with many shrubs and trees from far off lands. And I can't forget our manicured lawns. We need to shift our expectations for our gardens. And tonight certainly helped with that. As you pointed out, once these gardens are established, they take very little maintenance, almost no watering, and they support songbirds, caterpillars, butterflies, moths, bees, the list goes on, while also supporting our own human health immune support, throat health, cramps, skin rashes, inflammation, cooling and calming. I, for one, look forward to a little wildness, to focus on more scents, colors, tastes, and medicinal benefits. I love my bloodroot in our spring garden, the monarchs on our echinacea in the summer, and goldenrod in the fall. And I couldn't survive winter without my elderberry throat syrup or echinacea tonic. With that, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending, for learning, for exploring, and growing with the Lancaster Conservancy. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you soon. 